Oh my god, I'm excited to be here. <laughs> I'm also terrified, slightly terrified. So when I um, graduated from Decred, um, or when I was attending Decred, oh god, what am I doing? Good. Um, I had to sit there where the current students are sitting, and I had to I had to prepare questions uh, in each lecture, and I remember I was always terrified. Um, so I wasn't even paying attention to the lectures. Um, hopefully tonight you'll be able to pay attention to my lecture. Hopefully it won't be um, too boring for you. Um, so hi everybody, my name is Vera Sakiti, and I'm gonna time my lecture so I don't go way overboard. So um, I have to say it is a very big pleasure and honor to be kicking off the fall series of lectures here at Decret. It is such a pleasure to come here. It always feels like coming back home, and I am very, very thankful to Molly for having invited me to come back. Um, I'll be talking about tonight the work that I've been developing in the past year, year and a half, um, as associate curator of the uh, fourth Istanbul Design Biennial, which we titled School of Schools. Um, and it opened its doors to the public um, 22nd of September, so a few weeks ago in Istanbul, and it'll be running until the 4th of November. If you can make it to Istanbul in that time, I would love to hear what you think. But if you can't make it to Istanbul, I'm going to tell you everything about it tonight, and you can tell me what you think afterwards. Um, but before I dive into this project, and because I am back at SVA tonight, in the very program that I graduated from in 2011, and which definitely propelled me to where I am today. I just want to talk briefly about how I got from uh, here, which is me leaving Decret 2011, to here, uh, Istanbul Design Biennial School of Schools 2018. Um, I want to say that the most important thing that um, Decret gave me was without question um, the ability to express and articulate my thoughts in an informed and grounded manner. It gave me the possibility to make space for my voice and it helped me find that voice. Um, but in this day and age where everybody can be a critic, finding the spaces for that voice can be a tricky and challenging thing. So I would say that what happened after Decrit was a series of attempts, which go on to this day, of finding spaces for that voice to thrive. And criticism, we all know, can take many shapes and comes in many variations. And I feel like the work I've been doing in the past years explores some of them. So Molly referred to some of it briefly. I'm gonna show you some pictures. Um, so from some of the outputs of the, those experiments uh, and explorations were, of course, founding an editorial consultancy with Molly, Avinash Nalin, colleagues, friends, well graduated from the same class, um, which went on to develop a wide range of event formats and even took us to the 2014 Venice Architecture Biennale. Here uh, we developed a series of conversations during the opening weekend um, titled Towards a New Avant-Garde. And it explored similarities and differences between a new generation of Italian architects practicing today and the radical architecture generation. And all of this was with the help of an open source set of printers, which was designed by a Swiss designer, Swiss French designer, Thibault Brevet. And it made it possible to visualize the conversation topics in real time, because these sort of uh, bands of paper were coming down as the discussion was going on. And um, it also formed a space uh, after three, the three conversations uh, in the very imposing 16th century space of the Corderia dell'Arsenale in uh, Venice. Another way, another outlet um, in which I sort of tried to find a space for um, my voice was um, in my role as a web editor of a historical Italian design magazine, Domus, which uh, is almost 100 years old, which <laughs> sounds really weird, um, during the tenure of its youngest editor-in-chief ever, uh, Joseph Grima and experimenting on different ways to capture the contemporary, both in print and in digital. Uh, and here are some screenshots of content that we published on the website during that time, um, which during those years really pushed Domus's editorial strategy towards the digital realm for the first time in its history. 
um, and also introduced a, a series of forays into the recently digitized archives of the magazine. This is a, a page from a 40s issue of the magazine, which Bruno Munari uh, was um, art directing at the time. A few people know that he was also art director of Domus before he went on to become a very successful um, designer of many other things. Uh, and here is a uh, page of a 70s issue focused on Enzo Mari. Um, the archive of, of Domus and this, this idea of the archive, which is also a very contemporary obsession nowadays, um, was also something that um, is a complete treasure trove because you have to imagine this is a magazine that exists in a suburb of Milan, like a very weird place, and it has an archive of almost 100 years of correspondence with the brightest minds in the world of architecture and design. So you have to imagine, like in the 40s and the 50s, these people were basically sending little envelopes with pictures of their projects. So you can imagine the kind of stuff that they have in those shelves. And it was all kind of mostly digitized during the tenure of Joseph. And um, yeah, we just had like the ability to, to publish a lot of that on the internet and make it available to a lot of people. Um, another outlet was definitely the very formative experiment for me of trying to articulate possible futures for a post-industrial design scene in the center of Europe with the uh, 2014 design biennial in Ljubljana in Slovenia. And this marked my first collaboration with Jan Bulen, who was also the chief curator of the fourth Istanbul design biennial this year. Um, but back in 2014, the challenge was clear. We had to we proposed to reinvent the format of the oldest design biennial in the world. This biennial in Ljubljana dates back to when Slovenia was not Slovenia, but it was part of Yugoslavia. So back to the 60s. And um, we wanted to transcend this idea that a biennial has to become a showcase for the best products of a certain country or of a series of designers or of a certain theme. Um, and, and, and it had to become something else. We called it as, uh, we call it BO50 or BIO50 uh, because it was the event's 50th um, anniversary. And we sought to honor the fact that this event had been witness to many shifts and changes design has undergone in the last century from its birth at the crossroads of industrialization and modernism towards a discipline that permeates all layers of everyday life. It was a biennial of networks, it was a biennial of conversations, um, and here are some of the seeds that we then um, explored further in Istanbul uh, this year were planted. And last but not least, uh, to being the editor at large of an ambitious design uh, and material incubator, which has been set up in 2016 in Arles, in the south of France. It's called Atelier Luma, and it's the uh, brainchild of the uh, Luma Foundation, which is a very big arts foundation headquartered in Switzerland. Um, it is nested inside a cross-disciplinary center that is building in Arles um, on local resources, materials, know-how, and talent of the region. And the Atelier Luma is focused on creating new and sustainable ways of using the natural and cultural resources of the surrounding bioregion of Arles and the Camargue, which is a very sp special um, environmental uh, region and it focuses on things uh, varied uh, so varied as for example uh, trying to find ways to recycle agricultural waste by creating new industries here you can see um, a sample of basically waste from the wetlands which is, which is a bunch of mud and algae which is then sort of distilled uh, into a biopolymer and then uh, generates these kinds of things. So this is 3D printed algae, a biopolymer made out of, three, of, of algae that allows you to 3D print many different shapes, sizes, basically whatever you want. And right now it's in the process of certification to become an actual uh, new material which could, you know, we all talk about substituting plastics, but I'm not going to say this is the ambition of this material, but they've just uh, started the steps to certify it to become something as a food container, for example. Um, and the, this project works with a bunch of very different agents, designers, local experts, um, local industries, local agents, and it really tries to, it has very, very big ambitions to um, 
rethink the future of that territory and to dynamize it in a, in a special way. Um, and they, of course, are very interested in these ideas of circular economy, further engagement with nature, further engagement with the community, and the use of design as a tool for transition, so kind of an expanded use of design. Um, and the project by Tilia Luma is particularly significant to me because, in the context of this lecture, because it allowed me to use a lot of the knowledge that I gained in the making of my MFA thesis here at Decret which is a critique on the so-called social design practices that were happening at the time. Um, and it allowed me to distill that research into um, writing and further research, informed research, that helped to shape the initial aims of this project. And um, so th this was kind of a big deal for me. Still is, I'm doing a book for them now, next. Um, Ultimately, all these platforms have basically helped me hone my voice and test out several hypotheses. And in the last five years especially, and to my chagrin, because I really love New York, um, have firmly grounded me in Europe and the European design scene. So I find myself working more and more um, at the intersection between design and the contemporary, and also in what we call more and more this idea of a post-industrial design reality. Um, on the one hand, this idea advocates that Design has gone beyond mere, uh, merely product-oriented uh, discipline, but rather becoming more uh, focused on process rather than specific outcomes. And it also advocates that um, the contemporary world is no longer a place for and uh, of mass production and distribution, but instead design has sort of migrated through multi-layered networks of today towards local, specific, customizable scenarios where the designer is no longer the all-powerful creator, but rather an element in a network of collaboration and influence. And at the same time, in a world that is oversaturated with products and projects, the fundamental goal of design ceases to become the production of yet another chair. Um, this position uh, tries to advocate for design a uh, a position of inquiry, power, and agency. Um, and it also is, tries to be realistic, uh, given the, the time, uh, our contemporary time and context. Basically, it says that if we continue to make chairs and lamps, uh, we are doomed because this discipline is going to become obsolete because the, the industrial model, as it was thought uh, 150 years ago, is destined to die basically, and design with it, and they will lose relevance as a discipline very, very soon. So in fact, um, most of my work really dwells on this idea of trying to find new spaces and roads for the design field, and ultimately to fight for the relevance and existence of the design discipline in uh, what we call a post-industrial design world. And at the same time, and even in the gold land of Switzerland, where money is stored in mountains everywhere, um, that's where I'm based, of course, um, it gets harder and harder to conduct independent design research, um, research that is not tied to specific and marketable outcomes. Um, and so um, here I was um, sometime in early summer 2017, musing on how, in my opinion, Biennials and triennials were very interesting places for the generation of new knowledge in design and architecture. I thought, I was thinking how they have such, uh, you know, they have a specific timeline and a specific budget, but they usually, especially if they're peripheral um, and young events, so for example, in Europe I can tell you there's, for example, the Triennial of Architecture in Lisbon, there's the Triennial of Architecture in Oslo, designed by Anil Ljubljana, designed by Anil in Istanbul, they were pretty fertile territory for the generation of new knowledge. Um, and curators of these biennials, normally were museum curators, some of them were scholars, um, they were given within certain limits, complete carte blanche, so they could do whatever they wanted. And the proposals were, that were coming out of these events were usually very innovative and experimental. So I was musing on this when I get a phone call from Jan Bullen, who, which literally allows me to test out that hypothesis. So we were, he was calling me about the fourth Istanbul design biennial. And here, I just would like to say a word about Jan. That's Jan, if you don't know him. Um, I've been frequently collaborating with him um, since 2014. And 
he is the artistic director of Z33 House for Contemporary Art, uh, which is a very interesting and experimental sort of research-based institution in Flanders, north of Belgium. And it focuses on contemporary art and design. And he also serves as the head of the social design masters at the Design Academy Eindhoven, which some say is one of the most influential design schools in Europe. Um, so he was invited to be chief curator of the fourth Istanbul Design Biennial and proceeded to form a team with me as associate curator and with Nadine Buota, South African design writer and curator, who several years was involved in Design and Daba in uh, South Africa. She was part of the Design and Daba team. So there's the three of us a couple weeks ago, happy that finally it's all over. Um, this variety of perspectives really contributed to an overall attitude of questioning systems and definitions that are in place. And that attitude was kind of accompanying all the steps in the making of the fourth Istanbul Design Biennial. Um, but I want to go back to Bio 50 because I really believe that the starting point for this biennial was the work that we did with Bio 50. So, in 2014, we really tried to build upon the tradition and the history of the Ljubljana Design Biennial, while at the same time pushing it into an experimental and collaborative territory, where design was employed and implemented as a tool to question and to transform ideas about industrial production, public and private space, and pre-established systems and networks. Um, that's Federico Duarte, also an alum here. He, he was part of the biennial as a participant. Bio50 engaged designers and multidisciplinary agents from Slovenia and abroad and created 11 teams in a total of 120 participants. Um, these teams went on to work for six months on a wide and comprehensive range of topics that came out uh, of local research into the, the, the design scene in Ljubljana. So these topics included contemporary crafts, water supply issues, or the woes of an industrial um, and historical engine company um, that was having a hard time coming to terms with globalization. And very importantly, they were grounded in local reality, but they also resonated with global concerns. The overall effort of the biennial really aimed to be complex and transformative and sought to strengthen local and international design networks. Basically made a lot of people come into contact for the first time. And it also pushed for alternatives to implemented systems, tried to find a role for design in these implemented systems, and sought to create bases for resilient structures that could continue beyond the duration of the biennial. Um, and the outcomes were very, very different. So we had uh, projects that, on the one hand, continue to develop, to develop well beyond the biennial, um, such as this project called Hacking Households, which was a project developed by um, a group of five designers, which called themselves Hacking Households, and try to come up with a, an open source uh, system for household appliances in which you could transform and exchange parts and therefore create new appliances. So kind of create a Lego or a Meccano of pieces that could form um, a lot of different household appliances and try to combat this idea of waste that is generated because every time your toaster fails you kind of just like throw it in the trash and buy a new one for five bucks. Um, but I think the most satisfying aspect for me this is a project for a modular engine that could be used in many different kinds of um, objects. You could use this motor to cut wood, but you could also use it to power your bike. Um, it's an interesting modular uh, type project. Um, but the most satisfying aspect for me, at least, um, was that the networks that were created during that event continued to be strengthened. So. People continue to work together, they continue to teach together, they develop things together, people that didn't know each other before. So some did not, of course, there was a degree of failure in that respect, but some did. And those seeds became, on the one, on the one hand, fantastic projects, uh, on the other, they just became friendships. So these people sort of got connected and continued. And with Istanbul, I really think that we used this approach and took it to a complete next level. So the starting point here was um, much more ambitious um, and the context was more complex and had a completely different scale. 
While Ljubljana is a very small event, Istanbul, despite being one of the world's most recent design biennials, I mean, it's only in its fourth edition, and it was founded in 2012, um, it has really claimed for itself a research-based approach. And this is very refreshing and, and, and surprisingly, um, generates surprisingly innovative results so far. Um, so we had in 2012, the Adhocracy exhibition, which was an exhibition that was completely about open source systems. Um, it was curated by Joseph Prima, and you might have seen it here in New York. It was at the New Museum in 2013. Um, after being in Istanbul, it came, traveled here to New York and then to London. Um, then in 2014, it was uh, Zoe Ryan from the Art Institute of Chicago curating The Future Is Not What It Used To Be. And in 2016, we had uh, the third edition called, uh, titled Are We Human? It was curated by Mark Wrigley and Beatrice Colomina, also coming from New York. So um, we had a lot of ground to build upon, really, when we started. It was really very refreshing and very um, reassuring, basically, to be given sort of carte blanche to, to, to start wherever we wanted. And we had these very inspiring previous editions to look to. Look to. But again, as I said, we, in a sort of continuation uh, of the work that was done in 2014 in Ljubljana, our starting point was really this post-industrial reality of design. So instead of focusing on design as a discipline itself, we try to go back to the origins. We decided to focus on design education. Um, and our starting point was really this idea that 99 years after the Bauhaus, the design discipline and the design and the world, not just the design world, but the world itself, are very different places, but design education has mostly remained the same. So the Bauhaus model really has shaped and informed the myriad design uh, programs that we see all over the world. So even if alternative design education uh, initiatives really have consist consistently provided brave spaces for experimentation and the creation of new knowledge. You can think of examples like here you have some images of the Bauhaus, this is the Bauhaus Manifesto, Oscar Schlemmer's, you know, all these images have become sort of iconic and, we, and we, we use them frequently as inspiration, we turn to them frequently as inspiration. I would say that the MoMA exhibition in the Bauhaus really also helped canonize this this idea of the Bauhaus as a super um, inspiring starting point, which it was. Um, but you know, from the Bauhaus to Black Mountain College, from Global Tools to the Sigma Group, these initiatives really have helped design evolve, question itself, push its boundaries. Um, but they also push the boundaries of education, design education in general. Um, Additionally, many of these experiments also really uh, tested alternative ways of living, working, connecting with each other and with ourselves. And through these sort of process-based experiential research, new manifestations, meanings, and implications of design have really surfaced as a consequence. And Walter Gropius, this is the Bauhaus Manifesto, 1919. Um, Walter Gropius might well be proud to see that his manifesto uh, did reach universal aspirations, but the key difference between the Bauhaus of then and the institutionalized Bauhaus style education of today is that the original was a utopian experiment. So from Black Mountain College to Victor Papanek to from Global Tools to the Sigma Group in the 70s, Design history is peppered with examples of experimental pedagogies that really stretched this definition of design. But they also proposed utopian visions of the nature of universal education, really, and the conditions of society as a whole. Nevertheless, experiments stop being experiments once their outcome becomes predictable. Institutions become counterproductive once their own survival becomes more important than the utopia that they're trying to advance. The Bauhaus and its iterations, in short, have become myths. And these images are a source of inspiration. Here's Black Mountain College. But the reality of most of design education, even if inspired by these models, is rather uninspiring, we would argue. So what are we teaching our design students? Um, 
Judging by the hundreds of generic design portfolios submitted annually to master's programs around the world, not much. The same realities rendered in the same software programs by students from everywhere around the world, all tasked with designing solutions for the design solutions to problems from the previous generation. Design schools are still emulating the Bauhaus workshop will absorb the school model that advanced an apolitical universal model uh, and an apolitical universal aesthetic that prioritizes manual craftsmanship above all. So what was once an avant-garde design education movement has, over the course of 99 years, become a global institution. Um, looking at universal education, so just stepping outside of design education, if we take a look back and look at it as a whole, we see a system that is in place that is predicated on producing efficient, obedient workers and issuing qualifications as access and status control. So neoliberalism has perverted this sort of self-fulfilling institution to the point where students, given the illusion of agency because they're framed as customers, are often staking a lifetime of projected earnings in debt simply to be able to afford the education that qualifies them for a lifetime of drudgery. Yet increasingly, the reality is that less and less of the jobs that children are currently schooling for will exist by the time they graduate. And the gap between increased qualifications and projected income has been widening dramatically since the 1980s advent of computers. Parents and young adults banking on the previously fail-safe investment of expensive education have no guarantee of returns. Um, what happens is that today we live in times of constant precarity and constant crisis. Um, this present is at best a peculiar and at worst a terrifying transition period where old forces keep trying to reinvent the same traditional system of material abundance and information scarcity. This despite the undeniable evidence of planetary strain as material resources are plundered and our every human system from domestic routine to high-speed trading is run by the insatiable Leviathan of information that is the internet. And with more information than ever and more schooling than ever, the world and its leaders have completely run out of ideas to deal with the complexities that this inversion of logic introduces. New proposals are needed for how to organize society, how to structure our governments, how to live with, not against, the planet, how to sift fact from fiction, how to relate to each other, and frankly, how to simply survive. Sitting passively in class or in sofas at home, expecting teachers and leaders produced by the same debilitating education system to produce the answers is simply no longer an option. Pretty dreary. At this point, we decided to go back to design because we were just getting very depressed. Um, it's clear design and design education have to change along with this whole overall movement. But how can they react to the present? How can we change design education? Um, looking back at the Bauhaus, much like the Bauhaus defined 100 years of practice, perhaps an overhaul of design education could be a starting point to the transformation that needs to happen within the design discipline. But how to begin? Can we look towards these spaces for experimentation and generation of new knowledge that were advanced by these alternative design education initiatives? Can a biennial emulate these spaces and create those spaces of learning? Can we create spaces of exception where new learning and knowledge can occur? Can the biennial use question, reframe these previously tried and tested education models to create a setting for meaningful dialogue and design? Can design itself be a brave space for people to share their knowledge and ignorance, their experience and their curiosity? In this attempt, we decided to title the biennial a School of Schools and to try to create a set of dynamic learning formats that encourage creative production, sustainable collaboration, 
and social connection. These learning environments were to create contexts of empowerment, reflection, sharing, and engagement, providing reflexive responses to specific situations. For us, these specific situations are very important, very crucial to ground the biennial in Turkey. And therefore, the first steps in the making of a school of schools were a series of research trips to Istanbul and various other cities in Turkey, visiting Turkish organizations, uh, universities, cultural institutions, factories, and speaking to designers, students, professors, and experts living and working in Turkey. And here we searched for the local issues that could resonate at a global scale and proceeded to define an open call, which is a standard procedure of the Istanbul Design Biennial uh, since in its, in its inception, they always make an open call. But it's also a process that allows us to open the biennial to everyone. Um, and what happened is that we got more than 750 applications. Uh, we were expecting maybe 200 maybe 150, we were completely overwhelmed. Um, so it really showed us that this theme was something that was in people's minds, but this overwhelming um, application, number of applications really basically took us back to the drawing board and we had to start all over again, basically. Um, so it was apparent then that doubt was gonna become our strategy, doubting everything that's in set, everything that's in place, everything that is uh, stipulated as the system. Um, and basically the, this idea of doubt was this idea to um, start, not, not, not doubt as a soft or indecisive strategy, but rather doubt that insists that we start taking radical alternatives to pacifying and dumbing down of universal education very seriously. Um, and it doubt as, as, in, as insisting that this attitude starts right now with this biennial um, by creating a space to, for each of us to doubt, renegotiate, and relearn. Um, and it insists also that we become creative, with, uh, con comfortable with doubt um, as a first step to learning and as a first step to accepting other people and ideas. Um, so doubt as a strategy, doubt as an attitude that permeated all we did. Um, back to the drawing board, back to all these 750 applications, what emerged was that there is in fact a very expanded field of design that we should start paying attention to. So beyond the pragmatic uh, creations of objects or solutions, we identified these, I, these sort of three uh, more self-aware design directions. Um, critical, relational, speculative design. So critical basically as very aware of design's uh, instrumentalization and use in uh, capitalism and neo-colonial developments and so on. Speculative as casting an eye to the future to postulate on where the world might or might not be headed given the current social, technological, and scientific trajectories. Um, and relational as encompassing these ideas of social and participatory design, systems thinking that basically started emerging in the 70s. Um, relational not just about the object of design but about interactions between humans, objects, buildings, cities, countries, and networks. So can these fringes inform what design education can be? And can the expanded field of design show a way for learning to be a methodology and a constant characteristic of design? Can we invert the traditional flows of learning, so not, not me, a teacher, teaching you, but rather can we make these a two-way street so that we all learn from each other? It was at that time that we came across uh, Noor Horsanali's Halitmek project. Um, and this was the project that really helped structure the entire um, biennial. Halitmek is a Turkish word uh, that basically means um, to sort out, sort of to make do. Um, and Noor Horsanali is a recent uh, graduate of Bilgi University in uh, Istanbul, and she made a catalog of all these kind of like make do solutions that you can find in Istanbul kind of everywhere. You know, the first one is like a shelter for cats. This is a bench for street vendors. 
Um, and this is basically a place to collect uh, stuff that can stay during the day. Um, so basically, she was, here's a designer, a product designer, that's basically looking at the streets of Istanbul to learn from them. Um, and her project is not only an inventory of hack designs and a taxonomy of these Hallet make strategies, but it's really a web of learning by doing and learning by designing that stretches from the street to the ivory tower to the school. Um, and these principles of this project really became the leitmotifs for the whole biennial. The project inverts the relationship between ignorance and expertise, emphasizes everyone's agency on their surroundings, and shows the web of knowledge exchange that spans a city. So this idea of expanding uh, in, and, and sort of transcending the traditional boundaries of design education really became clear uh, the moment that we bumped into Hallett Mac. Um, and what emerged is this idea of an educational web um, that really brought us to what um, Ivan Illich uh, wrote about in his 1970 de-schooling society. This idea of a web that can heighten the opportunity for each one to transform each moment of his living into one of learning, sharing, and caring. Okay, this is all very nice. Um, but how does this actually <laughs> materialize into a biennial, right? Um, the same way that we've encountered um, an expanded field of design, we also tried to challenge ourselves to think of a biennial in an expanded way. Um, and what happened is that we um, took this bricolage approach as the main approach of the biennial. Um, a school schools is a bricolage of projects, impressions, ideas, and opinions that have conflicted and corroborated actively, subconsciously, and retroactively. Um, to shape an educational web that is presented as a lounge pad for doubt, dialogue, and conversions. So how does this materialize in the territory? Um, what we did very consciously is, if you know the history of the Istanbul Design Biennial, normally um, what happened is that the exhibition always took place in the same venue, the Greek school. It's like a very big um, 2,000 square meter uh, five stories, uh, one building, a former school. So titling this biennial of school schools, we should probably do it in school. No. Um, we decided to spread the biennial throughout the city. And what we did is we created relationships which didn't exist um, until then with um, six different um, institutions in the city. Um, Studio X Istanbul probably, maybe you've heard of because Studio X was an initiative of Columbia that started here in New York. Um, and the Studio X venue in Istanbul is still quite active. Um, and then the others are all existing cultural institutions that have a firm grounding and presence in the city. Um, the idea was really to create this relationship, not just with the institutions that exist in the city, so again, grounding it in Istanbul, but also to try and create relationships um, that could speak to this idea of the expanded classroom. So these six venues were the classrooms and the corridors were the streets. The Beyoğlu district, which is the district uh, that you see here on the right-hand side of this map, was the district where we spread out our biennial and it became kind of a distributed biennial um, with six schools. Um, the Unmaking School, um, was a school that focused on um, this irrepressible human instinct to be creative um, and sought to look at it as a pedagogical dynamo that can drive innovation, redefine work, and reshape our cities. And now I'm going to tell you a little bit about the, the six schools that we uh, came up with. And I'm going to talk to you about a few projects that, we, that you can see in, in, in these schools. In total, we had more than 120 participants just in the exhibition. So in fact, we were curating six small um, exhibitions. So from, um, all of them were kind of born out of research. They all had expanded networks. So in the end, we had more than 200, 250 people that were actively participating just in the exhibition. Um, we have here uh, FAB, which is a group from Turkey, which basically started a network of six schools uh, throughout the globe, from Australia to the US to 
Turkey, in which they shared a series of instruction sets to deal with materials in different ways. And then throughout the six weeks of the biennial, they basically created, with the help of this KUKA robot, they created a, an active classroom that is trying and testing out new construction techniques, new building materials, and you know, using materials such as carbon fiber, marble, and so on. Um, in the current school, which um, explored information networks, spheres, and connections, both digital and analog, abstract and embodied, we tried to critically examine technologies and hierarchies. So one of the projects is um, Abake, um, who is part of a, a collective based in London. And he basically used the fugu fish, which is a sort of Japanese poison puffer fish, um, which showed up recently in Turkey due to global warming. It came from Japan through the Suez Canal. And he basically used the fugu as a lens to create a whole new school that could talk about many, many different topics, either like global warming, either uh, you know the history of Japanese-Turkish relationships based on the fugu fish, um, the history of you know medicine, poisoning, and so on. Through a video, through a series of posters, through an installation at the Biennial, he really tried um, to uh, find a new starting point for a pedagogical interaction um, between um, designers, you know, everyone around in Turkey, but also um, the people that could sort of learn from the Fugu as a starting point to a new school. We started the school in Turkey and the, had the first episode of the school happen in the venue and then the second ver version is going to happen in London soon. Here we have the work of Ebru Kurbak, who is a Turkish a designer that's been in residency at the uh, University of Applied Arts in Vienna. This is Stitching Worlds, and it's basically a whole, of, it's a four year research project that basically tried to reconsider the connections between technology and textile. So if the textile world has been sort of relegated to women and the technology and information, digital information world has been relegated traditionally to men, she sought to try to combat these kind of gendered ideas and through the use of textiles, she developed a series of programming um, objects. So here on the left-hand side, you see the embroidered computer, which is basically a huge textile embroidered computer that does programming by using textile. Here on the left-hand side, you see the yarn recorder, which is basically a sound recorder that is made of yarn textile. Um, the Earth School, by in a completely different approach. We try to consider what is natural, what is disaster, what is progress, and who is in charge when the planet and the human are forced to renegotiate their precarious relationship. Here, projects really span, um, again, a bunch of very different topics that could be sort of harbored within this idea of the Earth. Um, so Navin Candosos did a project that linked uh, Turkey and Greece. It's called the School of Earthquake Diplomacy. So basically through a series of workshops in Greece and in Turkey, she connected a series of memories from common history of these countries, which were basically the earthquakes that happened in the late 1990s, um, very uh, first in Greece and then in Turkey, and which basically prompted governments of both countries to sort of collaborate in using strategies against earthquake defense. She basically c created these sort of big mural pieces that are painted with um, motifs of, uh, that are related to earthquake prevention and she had people sort of exchange on those memories while they were creating the pieces. And then she blew them all together in Istanbul with everybody that participated on the workshops. Again, this was something that took four months in total to develop. Um, on the top floor of this venue, we also had projects that tried to deal with new materials. So here again is the project of the 3D print al printed algae that I showed you in the beginning. Um, they developed again through a series of workshops with schools around the Mediterranean, so from Cairo to Tunis to Istanbul to uh, south of Italy. 
they used local algae from all of these different places to create new um, variations of this biopolymer. Um, in the scale school, we tried to investigate fluidity of taxonomies, quantifications, and establish norms, standards, and values to highlight scientific and cultural biases and assumptions. So projects ranged from Judith Thang Sang's German designer based in Berlin, um, performative project called um, School of Fluid Measures. It's a very beautiful kind of large installation in which these kinds of colors were mixed through performances to create new colors and new um, negotiations to this kind of very uh, pragmatic uh, and ironic comment on the fact that your iPhone uh, and your computer can more and more read your facial expressions and sort of quantify what you're feeling and therefore show you, you know, advertising that is related to what you um, are looking like. And this is Studio Le Grand Jaeger who develops this kind of tete-a-tete -tete, uh, conversational piece. Uh, which reads your facial expressions and then developed what they call the facial yoga class, which basically <coughs> tries to teach you to hide your emotions from your phone so that it can stop selling you things that you don't want, basically. Um, on the other side of the spectrum, we have the time school, which basically tried to look at durational perspectives and the objects that dictate them and try to investigate from slow time to deep time and to to make us consider and pause um, how are we spending our own time so here we had a, a series of projects that were also very different in kind of the media that they that they um, used so here is a robot that basically um, uses this idea, the 17th century idea of a commonplace book, which was a book that people used to, to like their, basically the notes feature of your iPhone, but in a book format from the 17th century, to create a series of machines that could, um, you could put your book um, here underneath these machines and sort of select what you want to draw and collect in your commonplace book and sort of like collect a series of reflections about time and the duration of time. Um, in your own book and take it with you, but also a textile project, uh, Emily Rondal, Swedish carpet weaver and artist who created a network of 25 weavers from all over the world and they worked through Facebook and they had to uh, Google three words, um, textile labor Turkey. Here's the first image that shows up in Google uh, images and have to live with it then for three months of your life because then you have to make a carpet out of that image. So this idea of the contrast between a snapshot decision that takes place in a millisecond to then the fact that you have to live with this image um, for three months of your life. And she got 35 people to collaborate uh, in the end. One, or 35 carpets arrived in Turkey, basically. They, we, we only saw them all together when they all arrived via DHL. Um, and then finally the digestion school, which kind of brought it home to this idea of, um, on the one hand, projects that have to do with food, metabolic systems, patterns of consumption, cultural rituals, and food infrastructure to consider how circular and lifelong learning manifests. So we really brought it home to the individual and this, these ideas and notions of, of, of care systems for the planet, for ourselves. Here is the work of Peter Zinn, collection of banner manifestos that he's been developing in, the, in rural Portugal for the last 40 years, which were all brought together here for the first time. Here a project from Gokhan Mira, who is a Turkish scholar, who has a very interesting project on the idea of transitional um, materials. So here basically we have a bunch of objects that have different asserted meanings depending on the culture that they come from. For example, the Nutella that comes from Turkey and it's not the same as the Nutella that comes from Germany. And the Nutella from Germany, Germany like Mexican Coke here uh, about 10 years ago, was very, very sort of, is very sort of prized uh, possession. So there's a huge like traffic of German Nutella going on in Turkey. If you ever go to Turkey, if you bring German Nutella, people are gonna be super happy. Um, so here's a, complex and large scale biennial, but we tried to not make it just about an exhibition. Um, we had a very active public program and we wanted to make the school schools 
an active biennial, so not just something that opens its doors and, and becomes a static exhibition that people can visit for six weeks. So not only we spread it over six venues, we also created a sort of very vibrant public program where many of the activities take place in dedication, dedicated active spaces within the venues, which we call the classroom. And they're sort of multidisciplinary spaces that you can use in many different ways. Um, and they're being inhabited by residencies, talks, workshops, all over the six weeks. Um, and the biennial also sort of evolves during the course of the six weeks. So projects like Judith Sang's, which you just saw, they're going to become something completely different than they were when they started. Um, and they're going to leave a lot of traces on site um, of what they generate. Um, but, you know, other than that, we also tried to transcend uh, the boundaries of Istanbul, because not all of you can go to Istanbul. Um, and on the one hand, we developed an accompanying publication, which I have here, Design is Learning, School is Cool's Reader. It's a sample of our public program in the opening days, um, in which we tried to expand um, the themes that were uh, in, the, in conversation during the making of this biennial. Uh, part of it is also this very beautiful series of photos by a Japanese photographer based here in New York called Naho Kubota. She's worked with storefronts and she has been doing a survey of empty architecture schools for a couple of years now. They're published for the first time inside this book. Um, to a website which has, you know, all biennials have websites, but here we try to make a journal which keeps being updated during the six weeks of the biennial and not only it showcases uh, stuff that is being shown in Istanbul but it also tries to look throughout the world to interesting alternative design education uh, experiments that are happening now. Um, most of all at the end of this whole educational pedagogical experiment we what we wanted to um, postulate is not a typical grand narrative that you find in these kinds of biennials, but a lot of short stories that together make a constellation of voices um, that, for us, illuminate multiple possibilities for the future of design education and learning. Um, you won't find a single prognosis, template, or solution for the future of design education in a school of schools. We're not here to optimize the system without questioning the mechanics of that system. And rather than offering solutions to to predetermined questions, a school of schools really intends to inspire doubt. Not knowing is the first step in learning, and studying for unknown outcomes initiates the potential for newness. We would like to start a discussion on design, education, and design education. We would like it to generate more questions than answers. This places the responsibility on each of us to become agents of our own education. In the end, doubt is like the fugu fish. It's the first step to uncharted territory. And I'm just going to end by showing you some images of the opening days, um, which was really just about a lot of conversations, a lot of exchanges, a lot of um, generation of new knowledge, simply by exchanging with one another. And the energy of, of what happened um, and the energy of seeks to emulate in a way the energy of the first images that I was showing you. I mean, I'm not going to say we're, we're, we're the new Bauhaus. I can't, I can't claim that. Um, but what these images attest to is, this, is to this incredible meeting of people, perspectives, ways of working, and opinions. Um, they are intangible. And so is the change that can come out of this. But I like to think that this, uh, too, like doubt, is a seed that was planted. Um, the outcomes, we will have to wait and see. Um, in the meantime, um, I hope that we can continue the conversation. And as a starting point, I would welcome any questions that you might have. Thank you very much. Should I leave? Questions? Should I stand here? Can there be a more anticipated? Did the fourth biennial was based on doubt 
Any ideas for the fifth biennial? Well, the beautiful thing about this biennial is that every time you have a different curatorial team, so I don't know where the next curatorial team is going to take it. But um, what I do think that we proposed and I think will probably be taken to the next step is really this idea that a biennial has to stop being just an exhibition that is kind of a showcase for what is beautiful um, and really should start more being a conversation and um, a series of um, exchanges of knowledge, basically. Was there any actual teaching going on? So um, there's a couple of ways in which the teaching happened. First of all, we tried to um, flatten that hierarchy. So the idea of that we are all teachers, but of course there were you know workshops happening in which somebody shared how they know this and that. The teaching goes on. Uh, so basically, it, hap it started about six months before the biennial started. We started with workshops that then became projects that were shown in the exhibition. But during the six weeks until 4th of November, um, we have a bunch of teaching happening on uh, the venues, you know, at the venues of the exhibition, we have these dedicated spaces that we call classrooms that have been used for lectures, workshop, performances, and so on. Um, but also we have uh, collaborations with about 30 Turkish schools who are taking their students to the venues and also doing sort of open presentations and so on, for example. But there's also, you know, a lot of more intangible kind of things happening as well. Like, for example, in the opening uh, days, we had Do, which is a publication of the Architectural Association, take up residency in a bar in the streets, and they were just basically flagging everybody that was participating in those opening days and sort of asking them to come in and sort of do a little lecture. So it, it took many shapes and, 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 and forms. But yeah, there was a lot of teaching, I would say. So far, it continues. <laughs> Exactly. That's a very good question. Um, I have to say that, of course, that was on our minds since the very beginning. Um, but we decided, specifically because of the context, to try and be implicit about things and not explicit about things. And I think if you go look at all the projects that are on display, and if you read, for example, the essay that we wrote as a starting point or in our publication, <coughs> you will find that those things are there but very implicitly. I think it's very important to try and be political about everything that you do because that's part of what we, what, what I was talking about just now. I mean, we, we, we cannot continue to think that design is a sort of apolitical force in the world of today. I mean, you have to stand for something. But, you know, given the context, you have to be smart about how you do things. Oh. Okay, uh, maybe I'll just start with there. Thanks. Okay, uh, how was this funded? And did the curators have responsibility for funding? Um, the foundation that organizes the biennial, it's called ICASEVE, it's the Foundation for Arts and Culture um, in Turkey. And they organize the uh, art biennial in Istanbul, they organize the theater festival, they organize uh, the jazz festival, they have a bunch of sort of cultural um, festivals that they organize and therefore they have a very good fundraising uh, team so I would say that half of the biennial is funded by corporate donors and the uh, that they sort of endorse the foundation basically and what the foundation does and the other half was funded by different kind of cultural funds so for example we got a Graham uh, foundation grant. Uh, we got uh, funds from the Dutch Creative Industries uh, Fund, and from you know, then depending on the nationality of participants, from different cultural funds from different countries, and so on. And did you have fundraise? Um, we had to accompany the process, of course, because you know, 
we select the participants and then we have to help the uh, fundraising team to sort of direct their efforts to what we're doing basically so yeah we had to communicate with the fundraising team a lot I love that and I agree with you, but uh, from my side of the pond in the middle of Europe, I feel like design, especially industrial design, is a discipline that really needs to fight for relevance. And we have to get out of our comfort zone, eco chamber, and sort of, if you talk to a scientist, he doesn't know what the relevance of design is. I agree with you. I think there has never been a time in which design is more necessary, but it just sort of, on the one hand, it should recognize that for a lot of for for a lot of people and for a lot of other disciplines, it is not important at all. Um, and at the same time, double down the efforts to make that relevance known and and apparent to as many people as possible. But I find that the the role um, of design being important needs to really step out of, uh, you know, the discipline needs to step out of its boundaries and it should really try and become this mediator and this sort of glue between many other things. It, but it needs to transcend its boundaries. And I find that sometimes the discussion can't, doesn't really get out of the, of the boundaries of the, the, the discipline. I, I would argue that we need to fight for um, breaking down the silos as much as we can. I would agree. I would agree. As a design educator, I would agree. I'd say that we do have to exist within certain parameters. Obviously, there are constructs that are in place that accreditation and things like that. So of course. We are working within those confines, but I do believe in what you say. I think it's in many respects we do try to do that. Yeah, I'm not saying you, you don't. There are, there, are, there are often boundaries. Exactly. Yeah. I have a quick question and a request. Um, so, could you talk just for a second about how you, or the weight that you attach to the publication in the scheme of this, which, you know, you talked about the value of the biennial um, tour, and it's like the biennial triennial that are essentially ephemeral and have like a maximum kind of flexibility. Um, and room for experimentation because of that, but the fact that yeah, they, they're ephemeral, so people who weren't there weren't there to experience it. Um, and yeah, the publication is something that, that lives on. So maybe, can you talk a little bit more about the actual publication and then also Definitely. the workshop that you're going to do with the students? Oh, yes. I'm excited about that. Hope you guys are as well. Um, well, it's exactly like you say. Unfortunately, not a lot of people can be present in some of these events, right? They, they go on for three weeks, for five weeks, for six weeks, for three months, but that's it. And if you weren't there, you weren't there. So I feel like what we tried to do is we tried to explore the medium um, of the exhibition as much as we could and push it as much as we could. We tried to explore the public program as much as we could and, and sort of push it as much as we could. Same goes for the publication. This publication was, I'm not gonna lie to you, it was hell to put together. Like, um, it is such a big topic, design education. Like, how do you even like go about it? Like, this was something that was on our minds the whole time. We are not the utmost experts on design education. We just totally are not. Um, and so how do you find a way to encapsulate what, we're, what you're trying to say while, you know, trying to not do a disservice to a lot of scholars, a lot of people that have talked about this topic as well? And how can you also make this theme such a niche theme, but at the same time so important within our own field? How can you make it like speak to a lot of different people? How can you make it like, again, transcend the boundaries of that, that, that are imposed. Um, so what did we try to do here? Um, we tried to, um, it's divided in five parts. So on the one hand, we have a visual annex where we have Naho's beautiful, beautiful pictures, and we have kind of a playful take on 
the assignment um, of, of design education, the, the pop quiz. Um, but on the other hand, we, tr we tried to um, interview uh, people that are, um, that are knowledgeable about what we, what we were trying to talk to. So we started with collecting a bunch of provocations that kind of charted milestones in design education from the inception of the Bauhaus till now. So um, the idea of the Bauhaus as the model for design education, the idea of creativity as a construct that is intimately tied to the notion of industrial production, the idea of the bureaucratization of design education and of the need for funding that basically makes all kind of independent research step out of design education or out of a public sector into a private sector and the idea of trying to fight the institution from within so harboring alternative design education initiatives within larger uh, systems and then we tried to invite a generation of new and young design critics from a variety of geographies to talk about um, issues that we thought were important to be talked about. So on the one hand, we tried to look and appreciate the spaces of design education. So we talked about the design studio as a space where basically magic happens and as a space that is the prime space for design education to take place in and how special that space is and how important it is to preserve and salvage that space in an age of super fast attention spans. Um, at the same time, we tried to talk about the vast apoliticalness of many design programs and curricula and trying to fight back on that. We tried to talk about decolonizing design education and we tried to talk about experiments, utopian experiments in design education and what we can still learn from them today. And at the same time, we also used, because this couldn't be completely disconnected from the biennial that we're trying to do. We interviewed eight participants in our biennial that have works exhibited in the exhibition, but also have a predominantly design uh, pedagogical uh, learning approach in their practice and try to illustrate how their practice, by interviewing them, illustrate how their practice can sort of influence what design education can be. So again, a very mixed bag of um, possible futures for design education, but again, here the idea was to start a conversation as well. I mean, there's a copy over there, and I'm going to put this copy over there if you want to take a look. The book is published by Valise, which is a Dutch publisher, and it's 250 pages of, like, dense text, I would say, but I'm actually really happy with what came out of this. So it's not like Instagram friendly uh, at all. <laughs> um, but hopefully it has a lot of insights that are useful to, to get people thinking critically about these kinds of issues. Um, and I was very, very happy personally to be able to give voice to a new generation of design writers. Um, and that is also what I'm going to try to be doing tomorrow in the workshop that I'm going to be having here with students at lunchtime. Um, yeah, and we're going to look at um, um, experimental design education initiatives happening today and try to figure out what is the benefit that they can bring to the overall landscape of design education right now, to put it simply, because I think you all need drinks, potentially. <laughs> Well, thank you, Vera, and um, everybody should join us over in the studio for drinks and snacks. Um, but let's give one more hand to Vera for a beautiful.